Hi there, today we'll look at Generative Adversarial Nets by Ian J. Goodfellow et al. So this one is another installment in our series of historical papers that had great impact. Uh, GANs nowadays, or general Generative Adversarial Nets back then, were sort of... Uh, this was the starting shot in a long line of research that is still continuing today. So I remember when I started my PhD in 2015, uh, GANs were just about spiking. I remember NIRIPS or back then NIPS in 2016 and every other paper was about GANs. It was, uh, there was also this famous Schmid Huber Goodfellow moment at the tutorial. Um, it was it was a wild time and this is the paper that started it all and the paper is quite well written uh, it's very kind of focused on convincing you that this is a sound method mathematically um, that it does do you know that it doesn't just do wild things and also it is already quite has a lot of the it has a lot of sort of the modern tricks for GANs already sort of built into it. So astounding how how much foresight there was already in this paper. But, but of course, GANs have come like a super long way since then. And today we'll just go through the paper and look at how it looked back then and what this paper was like. So yeah, join me in this, if you like it, please share it out. Let me know in the comments what you think of historic paper reviews. Um, this is not going to be like an, uh, uh, a beginner's tutorial in GANs. This is really going to be, we'll go through the paper. You'll see right here, the paper is from 2014. Um, so it would still be another like two years or so until GANs really take off uh, from this point on. But the introduction, course was really important. Okay, so <laughs> abstract, here we go. We propose a new framework for estimating generative models via an adversarial process in which we simultaneously train two models, a generative model G that captures the data distribution and a discriminative model D that estimates the probability that a sample came from the training data rather than G. Okay, this was sort of a new thing. Now, I know, I know people disagree with this being a new thing, but this was a new thing. And specifically, this, this was the first paper that made something like this really work for data. So to have a discriminator, the, um, and the words generator and discriminator were also introduced in this paper. So you train this D model, which is the discriminator, and the D model basically decides whether or not a given data point comes from data or comes from the fake distribution. And then you have a generative model G that uh, is supposed to just create this data X rather than coming from the database. So you want to sample a couple of times from the data and sometimes you sample from this model G and then the discriminator is supposed to decide whether or not it comes from the data set or from your count from your um, counterfeiter like from uh, this generator G. And it's supposed to see, say whether it's data or fake. So you train the D model as a simple image classifier. So people already knew how to build image classifiers. This was this was shortly, as you can see, before uh, ResNet uh, came on the scene. So people already kind of knew how to build CNNs, build really good image classifiers. And the, the thought here was really generative models weren't a, really a thing until then. So people were in language models, word to vec was kind of coming up, but they were st would still be doing like RNNs using these word to vec vectors for generating language. In images, this like generative models weren't really much of a thing. So you, you would do like compositional models or you would do autoencoders, which were just either really blurry or really, really artifactory. And there, there were also approaches like deep belief networks and so on, but they had their own problems. So there wasn't really a satisfactory way to do image generation that resulted in he really high quality um, images. Now here, I think the entire thought, and this is not really spelled out, but the entire thought here is that, hey, we know 
how to train really, really good image classifiers, right? This has been evident in these since since AlexNet. Uh, so for two years, this was evident how to build really good image classifiers. And the question here is to say that rather than also building really good generators, can't we like harness the power of building really good classifiers for training a generator, right? And this this is this idea right here. This wasn't the one before, as you know, in like an auto encoder, what you do is you'd input a sample into some kind of auto bottleneck thing, whatever. And then at the end, you train your output sample to match the input sample as close as possible. And then in here, after you've trained this, this part here is your generative model. And then here in here, you'd input like a MCMC sampler or whatnot. And then of course, variational autoencoders came up and so on. But still, what you always would do is you would somehow use the data directly. So this is data in order to train your model. So you would somehow say, ah, the output here should probably match the input in some way or in some at least distributional way, right? Um, this this was a new thing. As you can see right here, there is no direct connection between the data and the generator. And I think this this was the success of this model, the fact that the generator did not it wasn't trained from the data like you would do if you were just approaching this problem. But the philosophy here is let's use the power of discriminative models, which we know how to build in order to train this generator, right? So the generator's task now isn't to match any sort of data point, the generator's task is to produce images that the discriminator would classify as data. And you can do that by simply back propagating through the discriminator to the generator. Okay, so I think that's that's the only thing that's kind of unstated in this paper, the, the, the reasoning behind why this is new, why this might work. Um, but everything else is spelled out very well in this paper, I have to say, if you read through it. So the training procedure for G is to maximize the probability of D making a mistake. This framework corresponds to a minimax two player game. So as I said, the paper is very much focused on convincing you that there's something sound happening here. Because at that time, if you were to look at this, you would say something like, there is no way, right? <laughs> this is, you would be like, mm, yeah. Um, so, so I can understand the uh, motivation here to really convince people that, you know, something, something good is happening also on the on the theoretical side. In the space, sorry, in the space of arbitrary functions, G and D, a unique solution exists with G recovering the training data distribution D equals to one half everywhere. Um, in the case where G and D are defined by multi-layer perceptrons, the entire system can be trained with backpropagation. There is no need for any Markov chains or unrolled approximate inference networks during either training or generation of samples. Okay, so the point here is that it's much easier than current methods uh, of, tr of producing of generative models. And also, um, it does something sound. Now, let's jump into the loss function right here. So they say, G and D play the following two player minimax game with value function V. And this is, you know, still understood un until today. Um, that it was already like, if, if this was a pure engineering paper, they could simply build the architecture and say, Oh, we let these networks fight. And uh, they they are kind of adversarial, and they, they pump each other up and so on. And and this here was more much more into the direction of kind of a, a theoretical reasoning into why something like this w would work, of course, um, there is still a lot of engineering going on to actually make it work. So they, they have there's this value function right here. Okay, and the value function is the following. So what you have is you have the log probability of data. And you have one, the log one minus d of the generated samples. So here you can see and this was introduced, this seems also obvious now, right? But you have a prior on what this is called the noise distribution. Okay, so you have a prior on your input noise to the generator. 
because the generator is supposed to come up with very many different data points and if it is a if it is a you know non stochastic function like a neural network then you need some way to make to produce different images so there is this prior distribution over the noise you feed that noise into the generator the generator will produce an output you put that into the discriminator and then this right here as you can see the discriminator is trying to maximize this objective so the discriminator is trying to maximize the probability of real data and it is trying to minimize the probability of fake data okay it is this is simply a two-way classification problem um, at the same time, the generator, as you can see, is trying to minimize the objective. In fact, the order here is quite important. So the generator, as you can see, is trying to minimize uh, whatever this here is. So the generator sort of is trying to minimize against the best possible discriminator. And so this is one one observation right here is that the formulation is always with respect to a perfect discriminator now we know that this doesn't work because if you have a perfect discriminator then generator cannot uh, catch up because you have insufficient gradients and so on um, and this was already recognized in this paper as well but the formulation is with respect to a min max game and not a max min game so the other point I want to make here is that you can see the discriminator um, appears in both uh, in both terms right here. However, the generator only appears right here. Okay, and this this basically means that the objective for the generator is only this part here because the other part is constant. So the generator is just trying to make the discriminator think that fake data is real. So it is trying to make the discriminator the class of fake data as small as possible for the data that it outputs while the discriminator is trying to make the class of fake data more than the class of sorry of real data yeah it's trying to make it's trying to classify fake data as fake and real data as real whereas the generator has only this part on the right this is i feel this is um it's quite important. Um, why? Because already in this paper they recognized that this might not be the best practical objective and for the generator they can actually exchange this part here on the right to simply say we want to so we want to um, instead of 1 minus d also instead of log 1 minus d we simply want to use minus log d as an objective for the generator so you can kind of play around with this and as you know lots of formulations have played around with this loss right here and um yeah that's why we have like a billion 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 gan variations they introduced the reasoning behind this uh, so th there's an intuition right here and you can see already um, in practice, equation 1 may not provide sufficient gradient for G to learn well. Early in learning when G is poor, D can reject samples with high confidence because they are clearly different from the training data. In this case, this saturates. Rather than training G to minimize that, we can train G to maximize log D. This objective function results in the same fixed point for the dynamic but provides much stronger gradients in early much stronger gradients early in learning um, this is in contrast to like other papers that simply say oh we do this and they at least say it provides the same fixed point right uh, yeah so again they're, they're trying to convince you that this is doing something useful and that this is easier okay so this strategy is analogous to other things training maintains samples um, from a Markov chain from one learning step in the next to order to avoid burning in a Markov chain in another loop of learning. Sorry, okay, this is from another paper. So their point here is that it's analogous to other papers that use these Markov chains where you always do one step in G and one step in D. We alternate between K steps of optimizing D and one step of optimizing G because you have this inner maximization over d and then the outer maximization the outer minimization over g so this has already been around the fact that you kind of have to have these optimizations in lockstep but the 
difference here is you don't need any sort of like a Markov chain in the inner loop and so on. You simply need backpropagation. So here's an illustration of how that might work. So at the beginning here, you have your Z space, and this is always sampled uniformly, as you can see right here. This is from a prior distribution. And through the mapping, so this here is from Z to X is G. So this is the mapping G. You can see that the uniform distribution is now mapped to something non-uniform, which results in the green thing. So G is the green line, while as this is data, the black dots are data. And if you have a discriminator, the discriminator is supposed to tell you where there's data and where there's fake data. Now, so green here is fake. Now, this blue line is sort of a half trained discriminator. Now you train D, right? You max maximize D, the discriminator. And that gives you this blue line right here. So this, this is a perfect discriminator for these two data distributions. It tells you, uh, it's basically the, the ratio of green to black at each point. And now you train the generator according to this. And you can see that the gradient of the discriminator is, so the gradient of the discriminator is in this direction, okay? So it's like up this hill. And that's why you wanna shift your green curve over here according to the gradient of the discriminator. Note that, you know, we first trained the discriminator and now in a second step, we mini we optimize the generator so now we shift this green curve over in order to in along the gradient of the blue curve so it's important the green curve doesn't see the black curve ever the generator doesn't see the data the generator simply sees that blue curve and it goes along the gradient of that blue curve of the discriminator okay and then if you do this many, many steps, actually there are dots right here, <laughs> um, you will end up with a discriminator that has no clue what's where. This is one half probability everywhere because the ratio is the same. And you will end up with the probability of data equal to the probability of the output generated samples. And this can happen if the generator simply remembers the training data, but there are a number of things that counter that. For example, the generator is continuous while the training data is, of course, uh, uh, discrete. So there is this in-between things right here um, where there is no training data. In fact, to hit exactly training data is very, very unlikely, but of course you can still, you can still peek at the training data. But also, the, there, I think there are two things why the generator doesn't simply remember the training data. First, because it doesn't ever see the training data directly. So it can only see it through the discriminator. And second of all, because it is built as these multi-layer neural networks, it doesn't have the power um, to just remember this because as there is kind of this uh, notion of continuous function. So and the, these neural networks are rather smooth functions often. And therefore, I think that is something that helps the generator uh, avoid re remembering the training data. Of course, there is still this problem of mode collapse that was really big in GANs. So even if it doesn't remember the training data, it might focus on the easiest part of the training data and forget all other parts. And that um, was a direct result, actually, of this objective. So, oh, where was it? So this objective directly led to um, mode collapse in some in some form because it penalizes different errors differently so of course people have come up with ways to to solve that okay now here is the algorithm as you can see this was already quite um this was already quite the algorithm we use nowadays. So for k steps, this is the inner maximization. And here they say that we use k equals one. Uh, so all this is this is pretty much what we use today. The early days of GAN were still like, oh, how much do I need to discriminator per generator and so on? 
nowadays everyone's just using one step here one step there or even training it jointly um, works in some cases so you want to sample a mini batch of noise samples and then you want to sample a mini batch of m examples from training data generation um, so from this data you want to update the discriminator by ascending its stochastic gradient and this is simply the gradient of the objective and then after those k steps you want to sample another mini batch of noise samples and update the generator by descending its stochastic gradient and you can see right here already there is this uh, reduced objective that doesn't include this because it falls away in the gradient, right? Um, and they say the gradient-based updates can use any standard learning-based rule. We use momentum in our experiments. Uh, very cool. So I believe they already also say that um, it is somewhere here. It's pretty. It's pretty fun that they say Oh, in our generator, we only input noise at the lowest layer. So this is also something that um, if you think that G here is a multi-layer network, so it's kind of a multi-layer network that outputs an image, right? And if you ask yourself, if I have noise, how would I input that into there? It's so clear nowadays that, you know, we just put it here. But this was not clear at all. This was kind of an invention of this paper because you could, you know, put it pretty much at all layers. You could distribute it and so on. You could add some right here. Um, it, it, it was this paper that already established the fact that we input noise kind of as a vector at the very beginning and then just let the neural network produce the image from that. So uh, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. It's pretty sneaky how many things are hidden in these initial papers, how many decisions that are made there then are just taken over. And you know, this one, I guess, turned out to be fairly, fairly good. Okay, so here they go for some theoretical analysis. And the first they want to convince you that um, if the, the, the generator, if this all works well, if, this, if both parties, this generator and the discriminator, optimize their ob objective to the optimum, um, then the generator will have captured the data distribution. So the global optimality of this. And they go about convincing you of that. So the first thing that they convince you of is that if you fix the generator, the optimal discriminator is this. And we've already seen this in this drawing right here. So the optimal discriminator is simply the ratio of the data, um, of the likelihood of data versus the likelihood of the generated data. Okay, so you train, you always train the, this discriminator in the inner loop. And that's simply the, the consequence of this, uh, of a pointwise. This is true pointwise, therefore it's true over the entire data distribution. In the next thing, they convince you that the global minimum of the virtual training criterion, and this is the value function, um, this min-max game is achieved if and only if this holds. At that point, the training criterion achieves the value of negative log four. And this, again, this was already already here, the fact that um, this has a global minimum and it is achieved when the generator matches the data distribution, which is pretty cool. So in the proof, it's pretty simple actually. They first say, look, if this is the case, we just simply plug that in, this, the discriminator will be confused. So if the generator exactly captures the data, the discriminator will have no clue what's going on, right? Um, because it can't, because the, they're equal. So it must basically output uh, the probability of one half everywhere. And then your objective becomes a constant negative log four. Now, if you then plug that into the other equation, you'll see that the training criterion ends up being negative log four plus twice the Jensen-Shannon divergence between the data and the um, generated distribution. And since this term here is always positive, that means that this thing here can never be less than negative log four. And therefore the negative log four is the optimum. Okay, <laughs> that's, uh, it's the, the proof is, is pretty cool, I have to say, 
to show that this has the optimum at that place. And the last thing they convince you of is that this algorithm actually converges. And the convergence um, is simply predicated on the fact that if you look at each of these problems individually, they are convex. So um, like here is convex in x for every alpha. So each of these are sort of convex problems. And then it will naturally converge to the to their minimum. However, in practice, adversarial nets represent a limited family of distributions via the function, and we optimize the parameters rather than the distribution itself. Using a multilayer perceptron to define G introduces multiple critical points in parameter space. However, the excellent performance of the multilayer perceptrons in practice suggests that they are a reasonable model to use despite their lack of theoretical guarantees. So they say if we could optimize this probability distribution directly, it is a convex problem and we will always converge. But in practice, of course, we only optimize the parameters of an MLP or a CNN. And that doesn't always converge, but we have reasonable hopes that it will converge. Okay, so again, it, it's very much focused on convincing you that this is doing something sensible, which I hope now you are convinced. So um, there is a global optimum point. It's when the generator captures the data distribution um, perfectly. This is, um, this can be achieved and will be achieved if you can optimize these probability distributions with a reasonable degree of freedom and the neural networks provide that reasonable degree of freedom and you know give us good hope that in practice it will work so they apply this to data sets namely mnes the toronto face database and c410 the generator nets use the mixture of rectifier linear activations and sigmoid activations, while the discriminator net used max out activations. That was still a thing. <laughs> Dropout was applied in training at the discriminator net. While our theoretical framework permits the use da, 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 da. Yeah, while our theoretical framework permits the use of dropout and other noise at intermediate layers of the generator, we used noise as the input to only the bottommost layer of the generator network. Uh, again, this wasn't kind of clear at the beginning, and also the fact that to leave out dropout and so on in the generator was, um, I guess they found that empirically. And then <laughs> there was, of course, no way to evaluate these things. Like, how do you evaluate generative models? Nowadays, we have these uh, inception distances and so on, but then we estimate probability of the test set under P under the generated data by fitting a Gaussian Parson window to the samples generated with G and reporting the log likelihood under this distribution. The theta parameter, yada, 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 um, results are reported. This method of estimating the likelihood has somewhat high variance and does not perform well in high dimensional spaces, but it is the best method available to our knowledge. Advances in generative models that can sample but not estimate likelihood directly motivate further research into into how to evaluate such models. They were absolutely right in this. Um, there was a lot of research into into how to evaluate these models. However, I it is my opinion that we still have very very limited methods of evaluating models like this. Like we have better methods, but ah, uh, it's uh yeah, <laughs> it's not really, it's not really satisfactory how it is right now. So you see that these uh, models, these adversarial nets, by the way, they're always called adversarial nets right here, where I think um, we call them, like most people would call them adversarial networks. Uh, but it's just interesting to see um, the nets. And also in the title, right, it says, I think it says nets, does it? I think it does. We'll look at it after. So the, the out, they outperform um, these other models, in especially these, these belief networks were kind of uh, popular at the time. And you can see the samples right here were in no way comparable to examples that you get from the modern GANs. But this was already 
very, very, very good, especially the MNIST. And then here you could as actually recognize. So the ones with the yellow are always uh, from the training data set. They're like the nearest neighbors of the things on the left. Um, so they want to show that it doesn't some simply remember the training data. Though I'm not so sure, like this seems like it has some sort of somehow remembered the training data a little bit. Um, also this one right here. And there was already a way, so this was also very foresighted. So these A to C were fully connected networks, which might be one of the reasons why it worked moderately well, right? Um, but the last one was a convolutional discriminator and a deconvolutional generator. So already using kind of deconvolutions that are used everywhere today. So they are used in, in GANs, in whatnot, we, VAEs, to upsample anything. If you want to do you know, pixel-wise classification, you use deconvolutions. Um, so again, um, this, this paper sort of introduced a lot of things that later that we still use in GANs today. Now, I'm sure deconvolutions weren't invented here, but you know, we still, we still use them. Um, so legit, they were the first GAN paper to use deconvolutions. Ha ha. Um, yeah. <laughs> they also say we make no claim that these samples are better than samples generated by existing methods. We believe that these samples are at least competitive with the better generative models in the literature and highlight the potential of the adversarial framework. Today, this paper would be so rejected. Like, <laughs> wait, you're not better? Get out of here! <laughs> you can't claim you can't claim this anymore. <laughs> no, it doesn't work anymore. I'm sorry. Yours has always has to be better than everything else nowadays. Otherwise, it's a it's a it's a weak rejector. Experimental evidence uh, doesn't doesn't convince me. Um, you can't simply say something's cool. Also, already introduced in this paper, digits obtained by linearly interpolating between coordinates in Z space of the full model, like this thing here. Every single GAN paper had interpolations uh, in the like in this in the GAN spike, and it came all came from here. So already this is just like this is a like every GAN paper then had like rows of these like of these interpolations. Um, I should know I've <laughs> written a paper on it and um, introduced right here. Who knows if they hadn't done this? Um, yeah, I guess it's it's kind of an obvious thing, but. Still, uh, you know, very, very cool uh, to see that this was already done. And here, GANs compared to other different methods like deep directed graphical models, generative autoencoders, and um, compared in very many ways. So this is a actually a good reference if you want to learn about these different kinds of models. And they make the claim here that there are advantages and disadvantages. So disadvantages mainly come with uh, training these things because you have to train them in lockstep. Um, but then also the disadvantage is that you don't have an explicit representation. So there, there is no explicit representation of this probability distribution. You never build the data distribution. You can only sample from it. However, the advantages are that Markov chains are never needed. Only backprop is used to obtain gradients. No inference is needed during learning. And a wide variety of functions can be incorporated into the model. This, you know, I, I haven't, hadn't read this paper in a while. And uh, I, have to, I just have to laugh nowadays because you know, now all the people are trying to reintroduce, like there are as many papers like reintroducing Markov chains into GANs, being like, oh, Mo GANs would be so much better if they had an MCMC sampler somewhere. <laughs> and you're like, no, this it, the point was to get rid of it. And like, no inference is needed during learning, um, which, you know, for some of these other models, you actually need an inference during training right so so this is very very costly and how many models are there nowadays where it's like oh if we just do this um inference during training <laughs> yeah so it it's quite it's quite funny to see people kind of um trying to to just combine everything with everything and in the process sort of reverse 
reverse whatever these me methods were originally meant to get rid of. Now, I'm not saying anything against these methods, but it's just kind of funny. Um, yeah, so they had a lot of conclusions and future work. Um, they already say, you know, conditional GANs are very easy to do straightforward learned approximate inference can be performed by training an auxiliary network to predict z given x and this of course as you know has come you know has come to fruit very often early papers already introduced uh the the so if you have the g network producing some producing an x and then the d network discriminating that you would also have like a encoder right here to produce back the Z noise to give you the latent encoding, sort of like a variational autoencoder, but not really. It's more like a reverse generator. Um, you know this, models nowadays are big by GAN and things like this that employ this exact thing that was sort of predicted right here. Um, of course, there are much earlier models also using this, as long as I can remember, people have attempted to bring encoders into GANs. Um, you, they, they have a, a bunch of other things like semi-supervised learning. You can use this to do to do get more data for a classifier, which is also done. So a lot of things here already have foresight in this paper is pretty cool. And the coolest thing, look at that savages, good fellow, not even using the full eight pages, just you know dropping this on the world. Um, absolutely cool. Uh, mad respect. <laughs> So, um, yeah, this was kind of mm, my take on general, yeah, it is generative adversarial nets. And yeah, you, please tell me if you like historic uh, paper overviews. It's more kind of a rant than it really is a paper explanation. But I do enjoy going through these papers and kind of looking at them in hindsight. All right, that was it from me. I uh, wish you a nice day. Bye bye.